The modern travel industry has its origins in the 19th century. Travel logs, basically books that were similar to modern travel blogs, became extremely popular and fueled wanderlust across Europe. Laced with personal experiences of travelling through far-flung or remote places, they described the people and places the writers encountered. These books would whet the appetite of those who could afford to embark on long journeys. Now for British readers, travel logs from and about Ireland were very popular. They were usually a strange mix of modern poverty and adventure tourism, where the writer described the difficulties of their journey, but also effectively in modern parlance, slummed it in what they considered wild and uncivilised rural Ireland. It goes without saying they also appealed to long-held racist stereotypes in Britain about the Irish people in general. Although they were Irish themselves, Anna Maria and Samuel Hall, a husband and wife duo, were accomplished writers in this genre. In 1843, they published a three-volume travelogue on Ireland based on five trips they took across the island. Among the vivid descriptions in these books, the Halls claimed at one point that in what they called the less civilised districts in the west of Ireland, they had encountered people who had never tasted bread. Now, on the face of it, this sounded absurd. The island had garnered a reputation by the 1840s as being the breadbasket of Britain. Anyone who visited Dublin could testify to the fact that the city had hundreds of bakeries. The notion, therefore, that people anywhere on the island of Ireland had never tasted bread, a staple on dinner tables of the poorest in Britain, was hard to believe. However, only a few years after Anna Maria and Samuel Hall published their travelogue, they were proven correct. During the Great Hunger, those attempting to alleviate starvation discovered that importing grain for bread wasn't enough. In some communities, the knowledge of how to actually bake bread had been lost. In 1848, the Polish Count Paul Strzelicki, who was engaged in extensive relief works in the west of Ireland, would lament that he had to ask for four bakers to be sent to the west to teach people what he called an art familiar to the whole world. Nor was his experience isolated Reports from the towns of Swinford and Carrig and Shannon were similar. Now the story of how this happened is intriguing. Ireland has a long history of bread making stretching back thousands of years. The fact that Ireland was labelled the bread basket of Britain in the 1840s was also a literal statement. The ingredients that many bakers in England used came from Ireland. Thousands of ships carried ton after ton of Irish grain into British ports each month. However, while Irish bread might have been fueling Britain's industrial revolution, the rural poor in parts of the west of Ireland rarely, and in some cases never, tasted a morsel of bread, and some knew nothing of how it was made. This was largely down to the potato. In this episode, Beyond the Famine, the History of the Potato in Ireland, we'll explore the history of a vegetable that has had such a profound impact on our past. But this, as the title suggests, is not a show on the Great Hunger, That's covered extensively in previous episodes, so I'm going to look at the meteoric rise of the potato in Ireland, some mind-boggling stats of how much it was grown and eaten, and journey through what might be called the golden age of the potato in early 19th century. And then in the second part of the show, I'm going to look at the post-famine history of the vegetable and try and answer why Irish people didn't ditch such an unreliable food that had such catastrophic consequences in the 1840s. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire. Now before we look at our complicated history with the potato, I have an update about tours. A lot of you have been in touch about the tour schedule this summer and I regret to say I have been unable to schedule regular public tours because, well, research for upcoming shows and series has been too time consuming and something had to give. However, I will be leading two tours to mark the 700th anniversary of the Kilkenny Witch Trial, sensational events that rocked medieval Ireland. Now these are taking place on July 5th, that's a Friday, and August 17th, that's a Saturday. They're part of a wider series of events taking place in Kilkenny to mark the 700th anniversary of the Witch Trials. Now the tours will take you to some of the most remarkable places, not only in medieval Kilkenny, but medieval Ireland, including Kells Prairie, a hidden gem outside the city. If you've never been there before, it's probably one of the best medieval sites anywhere in Ireland. 
After that, we'll head back into Kilkenny City to explore the story of the witch trials where they played out seven centuries ago. Now, this tour is being organised by Kilkenny Local Libraries, so to book your spot, you need to email info at kilkennylibrary.ie. That's info at kilkennylibrary.ie. They have all the information there about the tour. I'll list that email in the show notes below. I will say spots for this will be limited. And when it's booked out, that'll be it because we are taking a bus to visit that site of Kells outside Kilkenny City. So get in touch with the library for what's going to be a really unique and special tour taking place on July 5th and August 17th. The address one last time is info at kilkennylibrary.ie. Sound on today's show is by Kate Dunley. Perhaps one of the most surprising things about the history of the potato in Ireland is how short that history is. Right up to and through the Middle Ages, the potato was completely unknown, not only in Ireland, but across Europe. Native to the Andes in South America, it was first cultivated around modern Peru and Bolivia, and it was only in the aftermath of the Spanish conquest of South America that the vegetable was brought back to Europe. The first potatoes almost certainly reached Europe on returning Spanish ships and an early reference records Philip II, the King of Spain, eating potatoes in 1565. How exactly they got to Ireland is a little less clear though. There is a tradition, many of you will probably have heard, that it was introduced to the island by the Elizabethan colonist, pirate and soldier Sir Walter Raleigh who took lands in East Cork during the Munster Plantation in the late 16th century. Now, while Raleigh did undertake numerous transatlantic voyages, there's no actual evidence that he introduced potatoes to Ireland. The vegetable did arrive on the island in Raleigh's day, that's the late 16th century, but early references suggest he had very little to do with it. During its early history in Ireland, the potato was frequently referred to using the Irish words unspawnach, which means the Spaniard. And through the 16th and 17th century, there was a lot of direct contact between Ireland and the Kingdom of Spain. Alongside fishermen and merchants, there were also Spanish soldiers who served in Ireland. There's even a somewhat sensational tradition that claims the first potatoes reached Ireland on one of the many ships from the Spanish Armada that were wrecked off the Irish coast in the 1580s. While possible, it's far more likely that the potato was first carried to Ireland on board an unknown and unrecorded merchant ship or possibly a fishing boat. But it had arrived by the year 1600. Now its history after this for a century or so is hard to pin down. One of the earliest references to potatoes in Ireland dates from 1606 in a record of a property transaction in County Down. But mentions of the crop through the 17th century are scant enough and it's hard to garner a sense of how widespread it was grown and how much it was eaten. By the early decades of the 18th century, that's the years after 1700, the potato was however being widely eaten but it was still only a supplement to what was a pretty diverse diet at the time. In contemporary accounts of foods eaten, even among the poor, there are references to fish, meat, poultry, vegetables and pulses such as beans being eaten as well as the potato. Even as late as the 1770s, when Arthur Young, the agriculturalist, visited Ireland, the potato was still only part of a wide and varied diet. Now this was all about to change in pretty dramatic circumstances. In the seven decades following the 1770s, the potato would push pretty much every other foodstuff off the table of the Irish poor. In fact, it would become the single largest crop grown in Ireland, covering around one-tenth of the entire island by the 1840s, and between 30 and 40% of the Irish population ate almost nothing other than potatoes. But this success was down to wider history. In many ways, the potato was only in the right place at the right time. So next, we need to head into what could be termed the golden age of the potato in Ireland. When the German Johann Georg Kohl visited Ireland in 1842, he, like pretty much every international visitor at that time, was flabbergasted by the sheer amount of potatoes being grown and consumed in Ireland. In the early 1840s, somewhere in the region of 2.1 million acres, 
that corresponds to one-tenth of the entire land mass of Ireland, was covered by the potato crop. Johann Kohl, that German visitor, described how turf and potatoes were, as he said, the foundation of all earthly happiness in Ireland. And for the poor, there was certainly an element of truth to this. While turf provided fuel, it was potatoes that provided sustenance. While potatoes were eaten by all groups in Irish society, including the wealthiest, the poorest third of the population ate almost nothing else. Most visitors could not comprehend the quantities people ate. Then and now the numbers are staggering and scarcely believable. I have an entire episode where I interview the culinary historian Dr. Regina Sexton and it's linked below so I'm just going to summarise it here but it's still worth saying the following numbers are not incorrect. So an adult male labourer ate around 12 to 14 pounds or 6 kilograms of potatoes every single day. And that's per day, not per week. Adult women ate slightly less, but it was still around 10 or 11 pounds or 5 kilos per day. If you find this hard to visualise, we're talking about several dozen potatoes every single day. This meant that families went through several tons of potatoes each and every year. And when I say they ate potatoes and nothing else, we're not talking about some type of loaded potato you get out of food truck. You weren't getting sauces and toppings like cheese and bacon. Back in the 1840s, if you were lucky, you would have buttermilk that added nutrition and a slight flavour or maybe pepper or seaweed. Now this diet gave rise to the Irish phrase Prothi or Majin, Prothi or Mnon, August Don Iroing, Saniha, Prothi Ayoing, which translates to potatoes in the morning, potatoes at noon, and if I rose in the night, potatoes is what I would get. As this potato diet became dominant and few other foods were consumed, This, as I explained at the start of the show, not only pushed bread off the table of the poor, but somewhat inevitably, the knowledge of how to even bake it was lost in some communities. However, while these stats might be both intriguing and fascinating, they don't really explain why this happened. Why did the potato become so dominant in Irish society? How did this vegetable go from being introduced to the island in the late 16th century to covering one-tenth of the entire island and being the only food eaten by one-third of the population? We'll answer that next, but first, this. During the summer of 1970, Belfast was a cauldron of political tension. The city was fast becoming the cockpit of the Troubles. Demands for equality and civil rights from the nationalist minority of Northern Ireland were greeted with brutality, leading to major violence and gun battles. In the summer of 1970, violence on a level unseen in decades began to break out in the streets of Belfast. On June 27th, several people were killed in major rioting in the north and east of the city. This was followed by three days in July that would change the city forever. On July 3rd, 1970, the British Army began one of the most controversial military operations of the later 20th century. Thousands of soldiers surrounded the Lower Falls, a working class community, and enforced a three-day curfew, essentially a siege of this community, home to thousands of men, women and children. Starting next week, my new series, Three Days in July, explores the story of the Falls curfew, focusing on a forgotten victim of the Troubles, Zbigniew Uglik. An intriguing story, Three Days in July, begins in the opening days of the Second World War in Eastern Europe and ends in Belfast in the summer of 1970. It not only tells the story of Zbigniew Ogluk, but also lifts the lid on the British government's dirty war of psychological operations and explores the murky world of how dark propaganda was used to hide atrocities. Three Days in July, A Forgotten Victim of the Troubles, begins on June 19, 2024. So make sure you've subscribed to the Irish History Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts to get that show when it drops. Now that series is going to be great. I kind of feel we almost need to shift back a gear to return to the story of the potato. Three Days in July is definitely going to be a different type of episode. But do make sure you're subscribed to get it when it drops. Now let's get back to where we left off though and try and answer that question of how it came to pass that the potato became so popular in Ireland. Or maybe a better way of phrasing it is, why did the poor, who had a relatively diverse diet around 1760, over three generations, stop eating all other foods other than the potato? So it's worth stating from the outset 
people were not forced to grow and eat potatoes, as in no one held a gun to their head. But the story is about changes in Irish society that left the poor in particular with few other choices. So the period between 1760 and 1840, when the potato became dominant in Ireland, is a really interesting time in wider Irish history. There was a lot going on. There were some really major dramatic events, things like the 1798 Rebellion and the Act of Union, but also more subtle, dramatic processes that were nevertheless having a profound impact on daily life. So the first change that led to the rise of the potato was a dramatic shift in the Irish economy. Before 1760, very little agricultural produce was exported from Ireland. Most of what was grown was consumed at home. This began to change in the 1770s as considerable amounts of beef, pork, dairy and particularly grain were exported for sale on international markets. By 1840, around one quarter of all food produced on the island of Ireland was being shipped abroad. When I say abroad, what I really mean is Britain. The overwhelming majority of these exports were being sent to British ports, where they helped sustain the Industrial Revolution. It has been estimated that Irish exports were feeding 2 million people in British cities by the 1840s. Now, this placed an increased demand on land for growing export crops in Ireland. This resulted in the poor being forced to the margins, and I literally mean the margins of farms and estates, where they often reclaimed land previously unused to live on. Now, in these poorer lands, the potato was one of the very few crops that would not only grow, but thrive. If you drive through some of the most remotest parts of the west of Ireland today, in what are often nearly abandoned valleys now, the last vestiges of long-abandoned communities can be found in the potato ridges that often run up mountainsides at seemingly impossible angles. These are a testimony to the versatility of the potato and its ability to thrive in environments that most plants, let alone crops, would struggle. While its ability to thrive in these marginal lands made the potato highly attractive to the poor, this was not the only reason it became popular. Dr. Regina Sexton, who I interviewed for an episode where I tried the potato diet, explained a crucial aspect of the potato was that you didn't need lots of utensils or cooking equipment to prepare it. If you had a single pot, you could boil them, or even without that, they could be roasted on a fire. This was very important in the early 19th century, as the poor in Irish society were extremely, extremely poor. While this increase in demand for land drove people to grow potatoes in great numbers, this was accelerated by another phenomenon at play, rising population. However, this was a process with a strange feedback loop because dependence on the potato also facilitated rapid population growth. This one takes a bit of explaining to get your head around it. So I'll take a break first and then we'll get into it. So the late 18th and early 19th century was a time of rapid population growth all across Europe. The Industrial Revolution saw large numbers gravitate to cities the populations of England and Wales doubled from 8 million to 16 million between 1780 and 1840. At the same time, these people were increasingly living in cities. By 1841, nearly half this population of England and Wales lived in large towns or cities. Now, during the same period, from about 1780 to 1840, the population of Ireland also doubled from 4 million in 1780 to around 8.2 million in 1841. However, what was happening in Ireland was highly, highly unusual. While in other European countries, the rising population were living in cities and large towns, the opposite was the case in Ireland. By 1841, some 85% of the 8.2 million Irish people still lived in small rural communities like their families had for time immemorial. As we have seen, the poor in this rapidly expanding population had access to less land and the practice of subdividing land, that's splitting farms between all sons rather than giving the entire thing to one son, led to increasingly small farms as well. This also drove the poor towards the potato. However, the potato is something of a superfood, so even though the poor had less access to land, the potato allowed families to continue to flourish anyway. Indeed, a diet of potatoes was very nutritious compared to the bread that urban populations in Dublin, London or Liverpool became increasingly dependent on in these years. This wasn't healthy 
and the difference between the Irish eating potatoes and the urban poor was notable at the time. While many visitors did describe how Irish people looked healthy, this is borne out in modern data. Multiple studies that examine heights recorded in prison records and military registers have consistently confirmed that people from rural Ireland were taller than their urban counterparts in Irish cities and people in general in England and Wales. They were also less likely to suffer from diseases associated with vitamin deficiencies such as scurvy, which were disturbingly common among the urban poor at the time. Now this doesn't mean that the Irish delighted in what was a very, very monotonous diet. The potato was popular because it was prolific and nutritious. However, the poor found this diet boring. Testifying before a government commission in the 1830s, a poor labourer, John Guinnessy, was clear about the matter when he said, Never believe them that would want to make you think that we'd eat wet lumpers if we could get good bread. The reference to lumpers is the most common variety of potato grown in early 19th century Ireland. It was distinctive given its lack of taste, its watery texture, but a prodigious yield. So by 1840, the poorest third of Irish society, some three million people, in a way had the proverbial wolf by the hair through their dependency on the potato. They couldn't switch to any other foodstuff or even diversify their diet because nothing else could thrive in the small plots of marginal land where they lived. However, at the same time, with the value of hindsight, we know that this dependency on the potato was extremely dangerous. If, for some reason, the potato was to suffer back-to-back failures like it would in the late 1840s, this would lead to a massive catastrophe. Now, the heyday of the potato was, therefore, the early 1840s. The acreage sown reached unprecedented levels. In the early years of that decade, the total acreage planted with potato crops exceeded 2 million acres. In 1845, however, this all changed, and what was the golden age of the potato ended in the catastrophe that was the Great Hunger. Potato blight, a fungus previously unknown in Ireland, devastated the crop, triggering the Great Hunger. While the crop had failed before, the crisis of the late 1840s was compounded by numerous back-to-back failures. One of the impacts of this was to shatter the confidence people had in the potato. By 1847, only 300,000 acres of potatoes were planted, a decline of nearly 87% in just two years. As I said, I'm not going to get into the history of the Great Hunger in this episode that is covered in an extensive series in the back catalogue. Now, while the Great Hunger came to an end in the 1850s, neither Irish society nor the potato recovered. In the early 1850s, over 1 million acres of potatoes were planted, but this was still only half the pre-famine levels. And in the following decades, a decline continued. There are a few reasons for this. There's no question that after the Great Hunger, incomes did improve steadily through the 19th century, so people could afford a range of other foods and were not totally dependent on the potato. But there were other important factors at play. One was the continued presence of blight, that fungus that had caused the failures of the late 1840s, which triggered the Great Hunger. While it was never as severe as it had been in the late 1840s, it remained a major problem in Ireland, and it was only in the 1880s when effective techniques of spraying potato plants with copper sulphate protected the crop against blight. However, Irish society by the 1880s was completely unrecognisable to the society that had been completely dependent on the potato several decades earlier. Essentially, the society that had been holding the wolf by the ears in terms of its relationship with the potato, no longer existed, so there was no need to return to a reliance on the potato. In the decades between 1841 and 1881, the population of Ireland had dropped from 8.1 million to 5.1 million. Farm size had also increased, as I mentioned, and while the improvement of living standards in these decades can be overstated, the levels of poverty were nowhere near what they had been in the decades during what I've called the golden age of the potato. This, as I said, allowed people to diversify their diet and buy a variety of cheap imported food that was starting to arrive in Ireland at the time. Other changes also contributed to the breaking of the reliance on the potato. Ireland slowly began to urbanise and as the poor moved to cities, they tended to eat more low-quality bread as much as anything else. By the early 20th century, even labourers, some of the poorest in rural Irish society, were consuming on average only one-sixth the amount of potatoes their great-grandfathers had before the famine. 
the Irish diet had returned to something more similar to what it had been in the 18th century, when potatoes remained on the table, but only part of a wider diet. Now, if we fast forward the story to the 21st century, the potato crop is now tiny compared to its historic levels. For every one acre of potatoes planted today, around 50 were planted in the 1840s. If anything, what is strange is that the potato didn't completely disappear off our tables and the wider landscape. This is something that people looking on from a distance outside Ireland find perplexing. I've been asked this multiple times in listener emails. Why do Irish people continue to eat potatoes in such quantities given the role the potato played in the Great Hunger? And we do continue to eat potatoes at a pretty high rate. On average, Irish people today still consume about 85 kilos of potatoes a year. That works out at about 230 grams per day. And while it might be only a tiny fraction of the 6,000 grams our pre-famine ancestors consumed, it's still two and a half times the global average. So why is this? Why has the potato, something so central to the darkest chapter in our history, survived when there's a range of alternatives available? The answer, I think, is partly because they are comparatively cheap, easy to cook, nutritious, but also because they are deeply embedded in our culture and historical memory, in a tradition that long predates the Great Hunger. Even today, a lot of Irish people still look forward to when new potatoes reach the market. There are spuds harvested earlier in the growing season that have a distinctive flavour. Indeed, the potato is so deeply rooted in Irish culture that it has been used in racist stereotyping of Irish people. It regularly featured in 19th century cartoons and Punch magazine even depicted the politician, Daniel O'Connell, as being shaped like a potato. It was also used as an example of why Irish people were supposedly lazy because the potato is a comparatively easy vegetable to grow. However, as we've already seen, this was not the reason it took hold. It was popular in Ireland because it was the only thing people could grow in the marginal lands where they lived. Now, in short, I guess the potato has become deeply embedded in our culture in a myriad of ways and changing cultural phenomena is an extremely slow process. So I reckon the potato, while not as popular as it once was, will probably remain a feature of the Irish diet for some time to come. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave the story of the potato. Next week, my new series, Three Days in July, begins. Make sure to double check your subscribe to the show to catch that when it drops next week. Until then, Sloan. Thank you.